So um, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to invite you to join us in the webinar for this afternoon, which is on COVID-19. And actually what we've been learning about COVID-19 and the impact on those who um, have rehabilitation needs as a result of um, any issues impacting on their voice, on the communication, and uh, uh, also on their swallowing. So we're very lucky to have a lineup, which is fantastic, I think. And I'm just going to introduce myself first. So my name is Kamini Gadhok, and I'm Chief Executive here at the Royal College of Speech Language Therapists. Um, in terms of who's going to be on the panel today, we're delighted to have Anusha Gupta, who is a GP, and she is also a service user. We've also got Dr. Camilla Dawson, who's clinical lead speech therapist at University Hospitals in Birmingham NHS Foundation Trust. Sarah Wallace, OB, consultant speech language therapist with Inshore Hospital at Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust. Gemma Clooney, who's our clinical specialist SLT, uh, leads in Airways ENT at Imperial College Healthcare. And Dr. Hannah Crawford, who's the professional head of speech language therapy at Tees Eskin Weir. Valley's NHS Foundation Trust. Wow, that's quite a mouthful. Um, so just to say, in terms of how we're going to manage the, the event, uh, we have um, asked our speech therapists to pre-record their presentations, and we're really grateful to them for doing so. And this was really in case urgent clinical work comes up and prevents them from joining the whole webinar today. However, they should all be available to answer the questions during the Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. Uh, I'm very aware that there may be questions that we cannot answer, but we will get back to you if we can't answer those today and make them available on our website as soon as possible. Um, we're absolutely delighted that Anusha is here uh, presenting live, so I shall be introducing her to you in a minute. In terms of the timing of the webinar, the webinar is going to be held for approximately one hour altogether. So we've got about 15 minutes of presentations followed by about 10 minutes for a Q&A session at the end. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, as you know, staff uh, at RCSLT will be on hand to help with any technical queries. And it's really important that you use the chat button for any technical questions or queries. Uh, so that we can look at queries that or questions that come in for the Q&A uh, for the speakers separately. So if you use the chat function, sorry, the chat button for any technical queries and use the Q&A button for any questions, that will really help us to uh, manage your qu queries in the right way. Um, I'm very aware that not everybody's going to be able to listen in as you're probably very busy seeing your patients. So we are recording this event and we're going to make it available on the RCSLT website alongside the presentation slides. However, however, for those of you who are listening in, we'd be really grateful if you could fill out the evaluation form that will pop up in the new window once the webinar window closes. Okay, and finally, if you do want to tweet about this, do join the conversation using hashtag RCSLT webinar. So turning to the aims and objectives, um, the aim of the webinar today is to um, hear about the experiences from a patient of her journey and particularly the road to recovery that she's been through so far. Also, uh, we did have a webinar last year, soon after the pandemic first started, to really share what our members were learning as a profession. And it's really important now that we take stock to identify what we've learned as a profession since the first wave of the pandemic. So you'll have an opportunity to get an appraisal of COVID-19 literature and what we know now, to hear about how others have implemented some of the most recent evidence, You'll have an opportunity to find out more about the tools that are available and the work that we have done to support the development of these tools. Also hear about key priorities for assessment and rehabilitation and gain some understanding of how COVID-19 has impacted on people with learning disabilities and mental health. We're also uh, going to be sharing some other tools with you that we have on our website. So let's turn to our first speaker. I'd like now to introduce Anusha Gupta, 
who is a general practitioner. She's married and she's a mother of a two-year-old girl. Anusha contracted COVID-19 in March 2020. And I'm just going to pass over to her now so that she can share her personal experiences about her admission and post-hospital rehabilitation. Over to you, Anusha. Thank you, Carmeny. And uh, thank you for having me on here. It's a great honor to come here and speak about my journey. Um, so as you said, um, I'm a GP and uh, I contracted COVID sort of back end of March, 2020. And as healthcare professionals, we kind of just get on with things, even if we are unwell. And at the time uh, when this happened, I remember, I mean, I'm an asthmatic. So at the time I was just very breathless, quite tight in my chest. And I thought this is probably just my asthma playing up until as you know, a few days later, things just started getting much better, much worse. Um, at which point, you know, my husband and I thought, no, I need to get this looked at. I need to go into hospital. So, you know, I obviously went in thinking it's just an exacerbation of my asthma. I didn't get to say my goodbyes to my little girl properly because I thought, right, I'm going to be back in a day or two, you know, after treatment. Um, but uh, sadly, that wasn't the case. So I was admitted initially on the 30th of March um, and uh, got much worse. Um, and then the early hours of uh, 4th of April, I was ventilated. And I remember that night very clearly, actually. Um, I was very, very breathless that night, really struggling um, to a point. That I remember I spoke to my husband. I called him and I said, you know, I just want this to end. Um, I don't want to live. It's I'm just so breathless. And a few hours later, the uh, ICU consultant came and told me, the news which any patient would dread that I would have to go on the ventilator and at that point I just thought because of how breathless and how unwell I was feeling that that was going to be the end of it all um, I called my husband and uh, I didn't tell him those words because I needed him to be brave for himself for my little one so I, I told him the news that this is what's happening and um, and to show me Ariana my little girl you know uh, to show to show me uh, on the on the video um, WhatsApp call, um, and sort of deep inside, I was almost saying my goodbyes, and that was really hard. And obviously, after that, the rest was sort of history. You know, um, the next thing I knew was when I woke up in uh, CTCCU. But obviously, um, after I woke up, you know, you you start to piece things together slowly over time, um, and so I knew that. Uh, um, 10 days after being ventilated, so um, on the 14th, um, because I had deteriorated, I had to go on ECMO. Um, so luckily for me, uh, it was uh, Dr. Julian Barker, who's the ECMO director at Within Shore Hospital, who had actually cannulated me on the night of the 14th of April. Um, and, you know, for a long time, things didn't uh, change. Thing, uh, things were not getting better. On the 13th of uh, May, my husband was brought in uh, by the consultants to actually have the end of life chat because they thought that I wasn't going to make it. Um, and that, I can't imagine how incredibly difficult that was for my husband. Um, and obviously, you know, it, it, I'd gone through various trials or various uh, treatments, nothing was working, I wasn't picking up. Um, and for a long time, you know, people thought that I wasn't going to make it, things were not improving. But miraculously, after the 13th of uh, May, uh, things started to take a turn for the better. And um, I eventually came off ECMO on the 16th of May. Uh, so 34 days on ECMO. And then on the 25th of May, I had a tracheostomy. Um, and then slowly they started to reduce the sedation. And that was a very odd, odd experience, you know, slowly coming out of sedation. Because I was quite confused, you know, it would be periods where I'd be with it and then periods where I'd be asleep. Um, and then obviously that was the time when I started to realize that I didn't have a voice because I couldn't hear myself talking um, and then trying to get my needs across to the nurses uh, was very frustrating because you know, um, naturally not everyone can lip read. Uh, some, some of the nurses could lip read. 
uh, which was helpful. But, you know, you almost feel locked in, um, you know, not being able to get your needs across or your thoughts across. Um, and I remember cleverly, I once when I was lying there uh, in, in CTCCU, I realized I've got um, a SATS probe on my finger. So one way of maybe getting someone's attention was to bang my finger on the bed rail, uh, you know, to get somebody to come over to me because obviously I couldn't shout over to anybody to come over to me. So that was one thing, um, you know, having no voice. Um, the other big thing was not being able to drink. Um, so we were talking sort of June almost, so it was very warm and not being able to have a drink, it was really, really difficult. Um, I remember I can't, um, whether, whether it was Sarah or not, I can't remember exactly the, the first scope that I had. Um, I was told that obviously there was a lot of laryngeal edema and it wasn't safe for me to drink at that point. And I'd have to wait another two weeks to be rescoped and then decide whether, you know, I'd be able to have any oral intake. And that at the time felt like a lifetime. Um, you know, to wait two weeks, not having any, even a drop of water, that that was really, really difficult. And I think when I was rescoped, I still wasn't ready to, to have any oral intake. So that was when my heart sank, really. Um, so that was one thing, um, not being able to drink, the tired, the fatigue, uh, being tired and fatigued. Um, and then I remember I was having periods of where my cuff would be up and then down. So when my cuff would be down, it felt so good. You know, I felt like I had a, well, I had a small voice at the time, uh, barely a whisper. Um, and then also I felt like I could breathe properly because as soon as the cuff went up, I felt like I was being strangulated. Um, so that was frustrating because um, obviously I had to be weaned on that you know, uh, periods of cough being up and down. Um, and then um, I was transferred off to ICU from CTCCU on the 18th of June. I saw my husband for the first time um, on the 19th of June, uh, the day after, and that was amazing uh, for us both, obviously. Um, uh, the other big step was coming off the ventilator. So, you know, this this contraption that was keeping me alive. So I have a lot of respect for it, but I hated being on it, you know, it was awful. Um, the secretions, the coughing, the gagging. So, you know, coming off the ventilator was a very daunting process for me. Um, I remember saying to the nurses, you know, just don't tell me when you're dropping the pressures. Um, and, uh, and I think that really worked for me, but obviously when there were periods of time where, you know, there were long periods of time when the pressures were low, I could feel it. But, uh, you know, I came off the ventilator. It, it was done slowly uh, under Professor Bentley's, um, you know, care. And, um, you know, the staff at ICU were absolutely amazing. They really, really looked after me. Um, the other issue that I had whilst I was in ICU was the, prolong the, the profound muscle weakness because of being in ICU and, you know, sedated for so long. So I had a lot of physio, which was also very daunting. Um, I remember my stomach would turn every time the physios would walk through the door, um, but um, it had to be done, you know. Um, and then with regards to starting to eat, um, that was something that I was very petrified about. You know, um, the first thing that I actually ate, that I actually had was um, sips of, cold milk and that was a godsend I remember I, I think it was Sarah um, and and that was amazing when I could actually drink a little bit of milk and then I think I had a little bit of uh, yogurt uh, which was great and slowly you know um, Sarah directed how I would eat um, and um, although I was still petrified about that it started off obviously with you know a soft diet pureed diet but I think the moment um, there was any bits in it, bits in the food, um, that really made me very nervous. Um, there was a time when I had chicken, Heinz chicken soup, you know, with the bits of chicken. And um, I would feel that that would be stuck in my throat. And that caused a lot of, um, a lot of anxiety for me because I thought I was choking. 
Um, but that remained for quite some time, this hypersensitivity. So anything that was not pureed, anything with any texture, it would feel like there were bits stuck in my throat. And that almost lasted up until a few weeks after I'd come home. Um, so that was quite frustrating. Um, so I think I, yeah, I was transferred from ICU to the rehab ward on the 16th of July. Um, and I remember even at that point, I had no smell, no taste. I had almost zero appetite. I didn't want to eat anything, uh, but obviously had to force feed myself almost. Um, and to contend with that hypersensitivity and the anxiety of that feeling of things being stuck in my throat. Um, and then eventually, you know, as I was getting stronger with the help of physio, which was one of the main things uh, of being in the rehab ward, I went home after 150 days of being in hospital on the 1st of September. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, I was three to four weeks of being at home, still having issues with no, not being able to taste, zero appetite, um, and that hypersensitivity, which sort of almost suddenly just left me. You know, I can't even say that it was gradual. It was just one day I woke up and that hypersensitivity wasn't there anymore. Um, and I was able to enjoy my food again. It was like it suddenly, you know, my senses had just come back and I started enjoying food. Um, and then the other thing, um, I started, uh, the, one of the main things for me, as you know, uh, I'm a GP, um, main thing for me was my voice, you know, because uh, I speak so much in my job and I was so worried because when I came home, I, my voice was still not of, the, of great quality. Um, people couldn't hear me if I needed them. So my husband ended up getting me a pendant buzzer, which made me feel quite, you know, I felt like I was an old lady, you know, in a nursing home, but uh, it was needed at the time. Um, so uh, gradually, obviously, my voice has slowly gotten stronger. I'm not able to sing rhymes with my little one, which frustrates me because she wants me to sing with her. Um, but I can't do that just yet. I can't quite get the pitch right. But the voice is stronger because I started doing telehealth work. Um, on the 14th of November. And at the time I could only manage about one or two hours of speaking. Um, and I would feel so tired at the end of it. And my, my throat would actually hurt quite a bit at the end of it, at the end of the day, um, on, the, on those days that I did do work. Um, slowly I have built that up. I'm still doing only a few hours and maybe just a handful of times in, in, the, in the week. Um, but I am finding that that is still a problem. Um, you know, having a slight sore throat at the end of the day um, and waking up with a thick mucus plug. I, I just can't understand that one. That's quite frustrating. And, and sometimes that can feel like um, I'm being suffocated. Um, and until and then unless I actually get that mucus plug off my throat, uh, I just it, it just feels very irritable. Um, so that's an ongoing problem. Um, so I'm going to be at the voice clinic on the 15th of February, where I will be rescoped um, for uh, Molly, uh, who's my voice therapist. She'll be having a look um, to see what's going on. Um, and we're doing a lot of exercises, uh, voice exercises to help, you know, build up my voice quality. Um, and that is really helping. I, I certainly feel that my voice quality has improved a lot since I've come home. So that's really been my journey, yeah. And I just want to take this opportunity to say a huge thank you to Sarah and her team and everyone in ICU and CTCCU. Um, they're the reason I'm here um, and I can only be thankful for that. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for sharing that experience. It sounds really harrowing and also, I guess, you know, the positive, um, future that you have to look forward to is really good for everybody to hear from where you were last year and those dark moments um you know to where you are now so that's great and I'm sure that the journey of rehabilitation will just continue in, in you know in the way that we would hope so and obviously nobody nobody's seen this virus before and what it can do uh, yeah. and the impact it can have and I think thank you so much for sharing all that because I think that real life experience that you've had and you know nobody would understand how that must feel um yeah. unless they've been through it so I, I think we're really grateful to you for 
sharing that, Anusha. Do stay on the call and listening yes, because obviously we'll have the Q&A at the end. So thank you so much. So I no, want to you. now pass to um, Camilla. Now, Camilla actually recorded this earlier for us in case she had to uh, disappear and not be able to do the whole presentation. So um, Camilla is uh, going to introduce her presentation herself, which is looking at the literature, the evidence and the practical application of that. Hello, I'm Camilla. I'm the clinical lead for speech and language therapy at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. I'm an honorary research associate at the University of British Columbia and an advisor to RCSLT in critical care. So we are going to explore the literature that's available about COVID-19 and dysphagia. We're going to talk about how we navigate this evidence and synthesize it. We'll talk about practical applications, how to create efficient and effective services and how we look after each other in these challenging times. As a disclaimer, this is not a systematic review. It is an overview of the evidence for clinicians working in the field. So the primary research which is emerging is really helpful because we didn't have this in the first surge. Some of this evidence is telling us that patients who have been intubated and ventilated as a result of COVID-19 may recover their swallows quicker than those who traditionally we would see with post-extubation dysphagia. Video fluoroscopy studies are telling us that patients have silent aspiration as a result of sensory motor compromise following COVID-19. But actually there are laryngeal complications which involve vocal cord palsy through to laryngeal edema and other sequelae associated with not only intubation, but potentially the impact of the virus itself on the upper airway mucosa. There's some exciting work which will be coming out of Sarah Wallace's group later on in the year. We also know that for patients who are admitted to hospital, big proportions of those who are admitted for over three days required speech and language therapy assessment for their dysphagia in our hands in Birmingham. And that was important as 30% of patients who required our interventions um, were presenting with significant dysphagia whilst they were in hospital as a result of COVID-19. We also know that following discharge from hospital, voice, swallow and airway outcomes need to be assessed. And we're noting things like subglottic stenosis and pervasive laryngeal compromise, which I'm sure Gemma will speak about. Um, as she presents. The literature reviews which um, were um, published around the same time as some of this emerging evidence, if not before, are reassuringly similar to the evidence which is now being published, which has patients involved. So the literature reviews told us that we should expect to see breathe swallow compromise, that there would be neurological compromise to swallow, and that actually as speech and language therapists, we needed to be mindful of the limitations that may be involved without using instrumentation in the first surge as a result of the aerosol generating procedure that that was. These also told us that actually we needed to be um, innovative as speech and language therapy teams and ready to use things like telemedicine um, to challenge the way and change the ways that we had historically provided care outside of the acute sector. Consensus state, um, statements also emerged. These were really helpful, especially when defining the role of speech and language therapy. Um, these statements told us about how we might optimally manage patients who are in the ICU. At this stage, they were also telling us things that we should be avoiding, such as cuff deflation and changing tracheostomy tubes. And obviously, some of that information has now changed as we've experienced these patients firsthand. Other pertinent literature, which I think is important to note, DONT paper um, that explores the pathophysiology of happy hypoxemia. So this is about patients who present with hypoxemia as a result of COVID-19, who seemingly have quite limited symptoms um, and aren't compromised in the way you would expect them to be. This, this paper really gives such a wonderful overview of what that pathophysiology is, and it's really useful for speech therapists. The recovery trial um, is a really important trial in the UK, which is looking at therapeutic interventions, which are likely to improve outcomes for people um, with COVID-19. So from uh, drug interventions through to high flow, through to CPAP trials, it's a really important trial. 
The COVID track collaborative is an important paper as it starts to tell us that tracheostomy is safe for patients with COVID-19 who have been ventilated and intubated. And moreover, our paper, which then went on to define what the trajectory of recovery might look like for those patients with the first 100 patients we saw with tracheostomies, tells us that we are able to decannulate patients usually within 14 days, that 49% of those patients were decannulated directly from their first tracheostomy, that 18% of those patients needed downsizing and fenestration, which is absolutely in line with the information we see about laryngeal compromise, edema, vocal cord palsies, and upper airway compromise. We're seeing that same pattern now in um, our institution. So I would um, alert people to this and to be mindful that um, downsizing and fenestration was a useful therapeutic intervention for us. This slide is totally biased. It is papers that I refer back to when I'm finding myself with clinical conundrums. Of course, Bonnie Martin Harris, Madison Max, Susan Langmore, and Stacey Scoretz are on there, who I think just provide us with cornerstones of understanding of breathe swallow interactions through to post extubation dysphagia. It's really important to note people like Martin Brodsky, who have provided so much to us in this first and second surge with regards to post extubation dysphagia. And there are, of course, huge numbers of other people from Anna Miles, Liz Ward, all of these people that provide us with such great overviews of what dysphagia is and how we should be optimally managing it. And I would urge people to refer back to some of those cornerstones of how we manage dysphagia and the evidence that's available to us when you're feeling overwhelmed by um, clinical circumstances that are challenging. Navigating this evidence, I would suggest you're specific. So as I've said, use the appropriate literature to answer your clinical questions. At the beginning, I said that there was a disclaimer that this wasn't a, a systematic review. It is not. And if it was, I would be recognising all of the limitations, the empirical evidence that is emerging, that methods have been compromised within our own paper as well as a result of not using instrumentation. Be very careful about the ways in which you implement some of this literature, um, recognise its limitations, but also celebrate what it brings to us and how grateful we are to everyone that's publishing at the moment to provide us with some information on this challenging, challenging um, clinical presentation. Um, I would suggest you create a hypothesis and triangulate your clinical picture with the evidence we have previously and the emerging evidence so you can start to a working picture as to how you may provide rehabilitation. Ask questions and I would suggest avoiding binary diktats about what you can or can't do. Really I would be suggesting you're um, generating hypothesis about the ways in which you might expedite rehabilitation. For us dysphagia was prevalent in people that were admitted hospital. I would also say now we're in the third surge um, in the UK we are finding it to be absolutely as prevalent if not more so than it was in the first surge we will obviously be publishing on that um, in the future we found that people had delirium which was hyper or hypoactive laryngeal compromise which is reassuring because that's emerging from the literature now respiratory swallow coordination challenge burden of secretions and significant fatigue as a result of that the way we managed it we provided exercise practice swallows we did augment texture and complexity of diet and fluid as required. I would really urge people never to over thicken drinks because as so many people have published, that's not good for anyone. However, for certain groups where they had significant anterior loss in early phases and had issues with mastication, small amounts of thickener were useful. Um, Avoiding um, distractions and recognising upper limb weakness was useful for those patients that have been prone, for example. Really important to recognise the majority regained nearly normal swallow function prior to discharge, regardless of the length of intubation or tracheostomy status. However, these patients are likely to need follow up in the future in the community, which I know Gemma is going to speak to in her presentation. So the practical application of this literature is about staff repurposing, it's about decompressing ITU, it's about avoiding people having readmission to ITU because they require a tracheostomy again because they have pervasive dysphagia. It's about flow through acute services when beds are at a premium. 
It's about strategic decisions that move beyond just those for a speech and language therapist, but for speech and language therapy within a therapy and a medical team and avoiding secondary infections. When patients have COVID pneumonitis, they don't need aspiration pneumonia as well. We would suggest creating core aims and objectives, which are manageable, bringing your team along with you so that you're defining all of the same things together and wanting to create the same outcomes together. Utility theory is useful. Think about your trade-offs and being deliberate. Jonathan Barron is a great reader. Any of those times where you're stuck between what you can and what you should be doing and keeping governance core to what you do and when you do it, when we're thinking about safety of patients who have dysphagia. Looking after each other is fundamental. So our own emotional responsibility, but our responsibility to others amongst us. Supervision and debriefing is really important. Ensure you have adequate sleep, rest and recovery and create routine rather than relying on adrenaline to keep you going. We suggest you give space for the unexpected when you just walk onto a ward or into a circumstance that can take your breath, that just makes you feel overwhelmed. Give space to kind of decompress and talk about that together and explore what your triggers, responses and the implications of these might be at work. We need to be there for each other to support one another. It's really important. So our lessons learned. Dysphagia is prevalent in the cohort of patients with COVID-19. We need protected and adequately funded SLT services. Avoid paralysis by analysis. There are absolute tensions in managing guidelines, consensus statements, empirical evidence, and then the people that are in front of you. Know what you're looking for, why you need it, and how you're going to employ it. And provide adequate supervision and support because we have to support one another absolutely at the moment and long term. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Camilla. I think everybody will agree that was a really interesting um, overview. I'm now going to pass over to Sarah Wallace and um, Sarah's again pre-recorded her, her presentation and will be available to answer questions hopefully at the end of this presentation. So Sarah's going to talk a bit about this, the sort of tools and resources that you are, are also able to use. So over to you, Sarah. Hi. Um... I would like to start by just saying thank you for the opportunity to speak on the webinar. So I'm Sarah Wallace and I'm a consultant speech and language therapist and I specialise in dysphagia and critical care and I work up at uh, Withenshaw Hospital in Manchester. So I'm going to talk to you about tools and resources that have become uh, available since the last rehab webinar that we did. These are both for other professionals in terms of signposting to SLT, but also for us as SLTs to highlight to other people and also to use with our own patients. So the first resource that I'd like to draw your attention to is the NHS Your COVID Recovery website. This is a digital platform for patients and it's actually the official website developed by NHS England. So this was a two phase project and it involved a very broad multidisciplinary project team um, with input from us, uh, our RCSLT advisors. It was led by Camilla and also um, Nicola Pargeter, Gemma Haynes and myself uh, worked together on this project. And we basically um, helped to shape the website design, but also helped to write the content for the sections which are dedicated to swallowing voice and communication. So phase one of this project was to develop the website for patients who are in community self-managing their COVID-19 symptoms. Um, it was launched back on, on the 31st of July and actually has had over 600,000 users to date and some really excellent feedback. So please take a look, um, tell your colleagues about it and any potential users that you can think of, direct them to this website. So phase two of this project was actually to develop a digital rehab rehabilitation package um, this package can be individually tailored to your patient's needs. It requires referral and assessment by a healthcare professional before you can actually access the platform. Um, 
it's particularly useful as an adjunct, I suppose, to rehab for anyone who may be able to benefit from self-management um, with virtual guidance and support from the professional, so from, from the SLT. Um, it's also uh, interactive, so there's interactive goal setting and monitoring progress, and the patient can actually ask questions or share concerns through the portal. So there are sections for SLT, physio, dietetics, psychology and, and OT. So um, why don't you think about registering your service if you wish to, that's the uh, address there. And when you do so, you actually then receive training on how to use the, the platform. So other work that has been done has been targeting GPs um, and highlighting uh, about COVID and but in particular about post-intensive care syndrome. So um, the Intensive Care Society ran a webinar for the Royal College of GPs, which uh, I was asked to contribute to um, in order to raise awareness of PICS and the ICS Rehabilitation Collaborative Group that we formed last year early on in COVID um, are also currently making a film um, for GPs on the same topic. So for the SLT part, I'm going to be covering voice, swallowing and communication, cognitive communication and airway issues um, in terms of what to look for, screening tools and um, referral signals to SLT. We have uh, also produced a, uh, an, what we call an infographic leaflet, which is also for GPs to again highlight some of the key concerns that patients may present with. Um, I'd also like to highlight an update that we have made to the comprehensive SLT section of the rehabilitation framework that we devised with the Intensive Care Society. So this is fully endorsed by RCSLT. It's available on both the ICS website and the RCSLT website. And again, this is for any patients actually, this is not just for COVID patients. Um, and it has suggested tools and questions that you or other pre professionals can use to indicate a problem and a need for referral to SLT. So hopefully this is a helpful resource for everybody. And um, just finally from me, um, an update on the pickups tool. So this is the screening tool, which is part of the rehabilitation framework that I just mentioned. Um, this tool, um, if you haven't used it and you're not familiar with it, should pick up the need for SLT intervention. Uh, it also assesses rehab needs at ICU step down and provides a rehab prescription if needed at the point of discharge from the ward uh, to home or to rehab uh, facilities. So the work that subsequently has been done um, is around piloting this uh, quite extensively in um, 26 hospitals. Um, we have pulled together all of that data and are about to publish two papers on the clinometrics, the validity, the reliability of the tool, and we've actually slightly updated the tool as well from that work. Um, but also we've devised some bespoke software packages and user support for data collection, which is available for any site that registers um, to use this. And actually Intensive Care Society are, are encouraging all ICUs to take on, take up this, um, this, this tool and this piece of work. So, that's uh, an update from me. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for listening, but also I'd like to thank very much Anushua for her um, very brave account earlier on. And uh, I very much appreciate her, her giving her time to, to us. Um, and now I'd like to hand over to Gemma. Thanks so much, Sarah. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you for that presentation. So as Sarah said, we now have Gemma's uh, presentation, which she also did pre-record for us. So Gemma Clooney will again introduce her topic area and herself. Thank you. Over to you, Gemma. 
Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to RCSLT for inviting me to um, give this presentation on COVID-19 and speech and language therapy, the clinical priorities. It's a real honour. Um, my name is Gemma Cleaney. I'm a clinical specialist uh, speech and language therapist in Airways and ENT at Imperial College Healthcare Trust and also an NIHR clinical doctoral research fellow. Um, I just want to say some thank yous at the beginning of the presentation. I'm not a neurospecialist, so I reached out to some colleagues at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, Dr. Mike Zandi, a neurologist, uh, Charlotte Massey, a physiotherapist, and Jodie Allen, a speech and language therapist, and also a couple of speech and language therapy um, colleagues as well, Freya Bell and Kate Harrell, just to clarify that some of the points that I was making were um, true in the context of working with neuro kind of COVID presentations. So thank you. Um, so what are we seeing in terms of COVID-19 and the symptoms that are relevant to speech and language therapy? First and most obviously, the respiratory symptoms. So the breathlessness, the cough, the mucus, and this can be either in the acute phase or more chronically as patients are recovering, whether that be at home or in the hospital. Laryngeal symptoms, so dysphagia, dysphonia, um, globus, so that horrible sensation of something being stuck in your throat um, when you swallow. And obviously the more complex airway issues that I would see in the clinics that I work in, um, such as laryngotracheal stenosis or even vocal cord palsies. And these might be as a result of intubation damage, but particularly in the case of palsies might just be as a result of COVID-19 viral infection without ever having been in hospital. Fatigue is a huge problem for patients um, following COVID-19 infection, um, as are mental health difficulties. And these things obviously come hand in hand. Um, if you're too exhausted to be able to do things, this will have a huge impact on your mental health. And I know that Hannah is going to talk about, about that a little bit later. Cognitive and neurological symptoms. So this might be memory and concentration difficulties. It might be um, attentional deficits such as speed of processing or information encoding. Um, and this could be as a result of um, the breathlessness and the fatigue that I've already mentioned, or it could be a kind of lingering inflammatory response, or it may be that the patient has actually had some kind of neuro event that shows up on the CT or an MRI, um, but clearly they're symptoms that are relevant to us. And finally, the gastro symptoms, things like reflux or a feeling of fullness um, that means that you're not very interested in eating and drinking. Some patients complaining of ongoing taste disturbances, um, and that can be quite reminiscent of, for example, the radiotherapy um, population in head and neck cancer who just don't want to eat and drink because things don't taste right. And this has quite a huge impact on nutrition, and that has an impact in itself on recovery. So it's something we really need to be mindful of. So just to talk a little bit about post-COVID-19 syn syndrome, um, long COVID, um, the NICE guidance describes it as the signs and symptoms that develop during or after an infection consistent with COVID-19 that continue for more than 12 weeks and are not explained by an alternative diagnosis. Um, now, the NICE guidance doesn't name speech and language therapy as a profession, unfortunately. I know that college um, really tried hard to make sure that we would be. Um, but weren't successful, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be involved in these patients. Um, it just might mean that in terms of funding streams that it's more challenging for us. But we know that patients with long COVID have word finding difficulties, acquired disfluencies, they might be chronically coughing, and these are all issues that speech and language therapists can help with. Just looking on Twitter, you know, this might, might only be kind of patient um, you know, the individuals talking about their problems, but I think it's still quite disturbing when you realise that patients are having these kind of difficulties. Um, so when I was preparing for this presentation, I came across a preprint, and I know that Camilla has talked about how important it is to be mindful of the evidence that you're using. But this is, it hasn't been published yet, but it is a fascinating survey. It's um, an international cohort, as it says, um, seven months of symptoms. They covered 202 symptoms and they surveyed over 3,700 individuals who had what is called long COVID. In terms of the speech and language therapy symptoms that were drawn out, um, there was difficulty swallowing in about 30%. Um, changes to the voice, facial paralysis, and then perhaps a little bit more disturbingly, over 49% of the respondents described speech and language therapy issues or speech and language issues. Um, and this is why we really do need to be trying to kind of pick up these patients where we can and where resources are available to us. Um, I know it's incredibly challenging at the moment, but we don't want these patients to kind of 
fall off a cliff in terms of what they're being offered or not even realise that there is therapy available to them. So what are our assessment priorities? Um, it's really hard. It's a novel virus. We still are learning so much about it on a day to day basis. And the virus keeps mutating, which means that there could be things that are very different in six months time as to now with our patients. But we do need to just be curious, ask the right questions. I always find that that is often where I learn the most with my patients is when I'm, I'm kind of basically a bit nosy and, and kind of try and find out as much as I can about them. And be innovative. You know, there might not be a standardised assessment available to you, but I'm pretty sure you'll have something informal that you can adapt um, and and use with with the individual that you have in front of you. Um, instrumentation is key. Um, Camilla's talked about that in relation to dysphagia, um, and it's true, for example, for voice difficulties as well. That if you can get an endoscopic view, you really should. Um, but that might mean, you know, if you're in the community and you don't have easy access, that you just make sure that the referral has gone in and that you're still working with the patient, but being honest about the limitations kind of in the short term, if you haven't actually seen kind of their larynx, for example. And similarly, if they have sort of neuro signs, but they've never been in hospital, making sure that they are being signposted for imaging studies or for neuro review if needed. Use outcome measures, they're key. They really help to guide our therapy. They help to collate data on this new virus and they help patients to see um, whether they're improving or not and then problem solve what they can do about that or what you as a therapist can do about that. So they're really powerful. I've already mentioned mental health. I think a key point is that some patients are really experiencing high levels of shame and stigma because of COVID-19. And we really need to be kind of supporting them with that and signposting them to other services if needed, as Hannah's going to talk about in a moment. And this idea of um, readiness for therapy um, is really helpful um, when we have such huge caseloads and we're trying to kind of problem solve who we should be seeing. Um, you can triage based on this idea of if, if a patient isn't really worried about a problem, even if you've picked up in your assessment, it's not going to be worth doing therapy on. And I've noticed that, for example, in the patients I see in, in my clinics, they might have a perceptual voice difficulty, but they might not be bothered about it. So I'm not going to work on their voice because that wouldn't really be very effective. Um, and then, you know, you give them information, tell them to come back, but at least you're not kind of using up your time and theirs unnecessarily. Um, the management priorities are um, really key to this notion that their recovery is, as a patient said, a roller coaster and not an incline. They don't necessarily get better in a kind of linear trajectory. For many patients, one symptom might be replaced by another and they can vary day to day in a kind of relapsing remitting type pattern. So any therapeutic input needs to take account of that and be considerate of that for patients. Self-management is key. We know from other work with chronic illnesses that people who successfully self-manage their conditions have much better health outcomes. So this idea of kind of patient activation using systems like the Your COVID Recovery Programme or even just something simple like a symptom diary to kind of keep track of what triggers their laryngeal sensitivity or their fatigue is really important and will help to empower your patients to have much better outcomes. Be individualised with your goal setting. So what are, their, what are their priorities? And be realistic as well, though. If they're talking about being back to how they used to be, but they're still crippled by fatigue, then you might need to be kind of introducing a sort of what is going to be good enough concept for them. And that will help them to come to terms with what they are able to achieve in the short term. And, you know, think about the changing priorities um, the person's trajectory in, in their kind of life and the demands that are placed on them will probably change with time. And um, so, for example, those patients I talked about with dysphonia, they might go back to work and realise that their dysphonia is a problem and they do want to work on it. But they won't know that until they're back at work. Um, and then finally, work with your team, work with your multidisciplinary colleagues. We can't do this on our own. We need to work together. They need to refer to us. We need to refer to them. We need to just be con constantly making sure that we're kind of trying to support our patients and ourselves in the best ways possible. Um, and acknowledge the limitations. This is a new virus. We're still learning. We don't know all the answers. And it's OK to tell your patients that as well and to tell yourselves that and your teams that. What you have is good enough, but it might seem really, really hard right now. 
you're trying to work in PPE, which limits your communication and impacts on therapeutic relationships. Um, everybody's got issues with staff absence and the impact of COVID-19 personally, with family members being sick, for example. There's different organisational policies and programmes in terms of redeployment or whether you can use telehealth or remote management or whether outpatient appointments have been completely cancelled because of a surge. We all have to recognise the limitations of our therapeutic input at this time in any setting and be kind to ourselves. And if you need to, ask for help. Um, you're not alone. I'm going to hand over to Hannah um, in a moment, but I just wanted to say that I have a lot of resources from having developed this presentation. I'm very happy to send out to people. Um, RCSLT have my email address and I think we'll probably be sending them out hopefully as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gemma. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, and thanks for your um, op the opportunity to share the, the information that you have through us too. That's fantastic. So we're now going to view a recording from Dr. Hannah Crawford again. She will introduce herself and her topic area. So over to you, Hannah. Hello, my name is Hannah Crawford. I'm the professional head of speech and language therapy at Tees, Esk and Weir Valleys NHS Foundation Trust. Within Tees, Esk and Weir Valleys, we offer services to people with mental health and learning disabilities. And I'm here to talk to you about the impact that the pandemic has had on these populations, but also the impact the pandemic is likely to have on people without pre-existing mental health conditions. So in a report by Dimensions in association with the Learning Disability England and Voluntary Organisations Disability Group in 2020, this group reported that people with a learning disabilities feel more isolated from society due to the pandemic. And that includes people with a learning disability and or autism. And anecdotally, we see, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, that care providers were wanting to avoid community contact um, for the people that they care for. And also we have some groups within this population who fall into the extremely vulnerable category and will have spent a long time shielding. This group report that they feel like they have not they don't matter compared to other people. 76% of respondents with a learning disability and or autism have reported that feeling. 75% worry that after the pandemic, they won't get the same opportunities that they had before. 97% feel that government should do more to address their specific needs. And 97% say it's important that more people understand how coronavirus has affected people with learning disabilities and autism. In terms of the physical impact that coronavirus has had on people with a learning disability, in, in a summary report by Public Health England based on the work done by the leader team at the University of Bristol, they report that the death rate for people with a learning disabilities is 2.3 times that of the general population. If we take into account the phenomenon of underreporting, then the estimate that is that 3.6 times the general population of people with learning disabilities have died as a result of COVID-19. In a study, a large study done by UCSL, UCL the COVID-19 social study, where 90,000 participants took part, then there is a reports of impact of COVID on mental health of those without pre-existing mental ill health. So 69% of people report that they're somewhat or very worried about the effect that COVID-19 is having on their lives. 63% worry about the future, 56% feel stressed or anxious, and 49% of people report feeling bored. There are harder hit groups in terms of the impact of coronavirus on individuals' mental health, and they include young adults, women, those on a lower income, and those with pre-existing mental ill health. And it is important to bear in mind that those with pre-existing mental ill health, both working age adults and older adults, are also more vulnerable to physical health conditions and will be more likely to see impact of COVID-19 on their physical health as well as their mental health. 
In terms of the key drivers for the impact of coronavirus on mental health, these include social isolation, job and financial losses, housing insecurity and quality, working in a frontline setting, a loss of coping mechanisms, and a reduced access to mental health services. If we move to the impact of coronavirus on children, there is an, a risk of increased stress and reduction of supportive resources and a risk of related post-traumatic distress. We see an increase on poverty impacting on housing, nutrition and well-being for children. And in a report by UNICEF in October 2020 and a report by the Mental Health Foundation at the end of last year, we see an impact for children more broadly on antenatal care but also on their education and for children living in violent households or suffering exploitation or abuse, the impact of the virus is more significant. And we are seeing an impact of the virus on the mental health of children as a result of these factors. At the end of December last year, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health reported a fourfold increase in eating disorders. The evidence around the impact of coronavirus on people with mental ill health, on people with a learning disability on, and on the mental health of those who previously did not have pre-existing conditions is developing. But this is a summary of the evidence that exists so far. There are a multitude of sources of support for people and the national charitable organisations, many offer um, support online and there is a nice um, collection of links on um, NHS England's website and the link is included here. Many mental health trusts have developed their own web-based resources and um, we are urging individuals to contact their mental health trusts and their GPs to seek support as required. And we are seeing the developments of resilience hubs across the UK who will be able to help support. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Hannah. Um, and finally, I just want to outline some of the guidance uh, and resources that are available on the RCSLT website. Um, and there's a link here to the website page where you can find some of these really useful things. So it does include the recordings of the past COVID webinars, which I think would be interesting actually to see how we've learned more about the impact of the virus since uh, last year. We've also uh, very importantly got information around health and well-being and resources for, for all of you. We're very aware of the impact at the moment around uh, um, all our members and the teams that you work with. We, we think and we do know that there are uh, lots of um, potential options for taking these up locally, but if you do need any other help, then please do have a look on the web pages and join the discussion forum for any peer to peer support. Uh, in the next slide, uh, it just highlights really the, the work that's been done on developing guidance in relation to COVID-19, obviously with and through our members. So here's a list of things that is available and uh, we hope that you know again you'll be able to have a look on the website and see uh, you know how you can use some of these for yourselves. Um, so I'm just aware that we're beginning to run out of time but I do want to take some of the questions. So we had a number of questions that came through the Q&A function. I've been keeping a quick eye on them. Um, so one is from Gary who's asked about what high quality headsets are recommended to be able to assess voice virtually. I'm not sure if anybody's able to answer that one. That's a, a, a new one, but I don't know if anybody's come across that that's on the panel. Uh, well, I'm not sure, but I know uh, my voice experts in my team can potentially answer that. If um, if I have an email address, I can put them in touch with, with people unless Gemma knows. Hi, I am here. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. We can. Okay. Um, I, I mean, we're using um, Microsoft. I've actually got them here, but I, I don't know if my camera's come on. Um, it should have done, but it doesn't seem to want to work. Um, but again, yeah, I can email with what we're using if that's helpful, if the member wants to send their... 
Okay. Um, I think I think Gemma, what we'll do is we'll put the answers on the website with the questions. Yeah. So don't worry, rather than individual emails, that would probably be better so everybody can see that. Um, another question is about what non-digital support is available for those recovering at home. Um, and they're thinking particularly, though not exclusively, of the many elderly patients who do not have access to technical, um, well, technical access, really. I don't know if anybody has an answer to that. Obviously, you would hope that the local speech therapy service would also provide support, but I don't know if anybody has a different response. No. I don't know, Je um, Sarah, when you did the um, webinar for GPs, uh, did that include how they might be able to support people who might not know about or be able to access some of the digital platforms that have been developed? No, it wasn't, that wasn't really recovered, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, no worries. And somebody's asked if the GP training was also um, covered the UK. I'm assuming it did if it was RCGP, because it's, they are yeah, UK Yeah, um, I knew sure might know better than me, actually. Does the Royal College of GPs cover cover Northern Ireland and as well? Do you know? I think it does. Yes, <laughs> I think it does. <laughs> Sorry to okay. put you on the spot. <laughs> so, so hopefully, I'm pretty sure it does. If the person who's asked the question wants to have a look, then it would have been open to all their members. Obviously, we don't know how many would have uh, shown up from the different uh, devolved nations. Um, so there is a, a concern about obviously access for people if we're not mentioned in the NICE guidance. We're, we're not mentioned as part of the core team, but they are very aware that speech therapy might be required. I think there's a, a differentiation there. Uh, obviously, we'll continue to gather the evidence to make the case that we should be part of the core team as we go through our learning and our sharing of the information that we have. Um, so there's a question about um, the use of cervical Oscillation, excuse me if I've pronounced this incorrectly, if if uh, that has been stopped for dysphagia assessments, they've said the use of it, sorry, has been stopped for dysphagia assessments in their trust. Is there indication when this could be reintroduced? Um, we don't use cervical auscultation in our trust here in Birmingham because the evidence base is, um, is not very robust. Um, and certainly I think when you're listening to upper airway secretions for the benefit of um, listening to upper airway secretions when people have florid upper airway secretions as a result of um, COVID, both in pneumonitis, um, but also from a mucosal damage perspective, because we're thinking we're seeing a pretty prolific um, laryngitis, pharyngitis picture for many people, and also glossitis later on. Um, I personally don't know that there's a role for it and wouldn't be using it, so I can't comment on when it could be brought back in, but I think the challenge of false positives or false negatives because of the secretion burden would be significant um, on top of the evidence base that's available. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I so, add, sorry, sorry. Add, so we agree with you totally, Camilla, but we do use it sometimes for, um, you know, with, with a lot of discretion. But I think um, the concern was around infection. And as long as you're cleaning your stethoscope, if you if you are normally using that tool, I don't think there's a reason not to use it any longer. Um, it's just about being sensible about disinfection and decontamination of equipment and not sharing equipment. But yeah, I completely agree with you about lack of reliability and robust evidence. But it can be, I think, sometimes useful to see if there's upper airway airflow, for instance, potentially in a trackie when you put the cuff down and, and just uh, sort of listening a little bit here and there. But yeah, um, I we we have resumed using it. Thank you so much. So I'm aware that we've just run over by a few minutes, but um, I thought it'd be helpful just to answer some of those uh, questions live. I don't know if the panellists have seen any question that they particularly want to answer while we're on the webinar, um, or if we should take the rest through the website and get them up later. I just wanted to make the comment actually that the question about headsets, the um, guidance that we wrote post COVID, um, a group of us, including Sue Jones and um, others in Manchester, included details in an appendix about the right sort of technology. So that is available on the college website for that person who was asking. Okay, thanks so much. 
Any, anything that anyone wants to pick up from the uh, questions before we say farewell? Okay. Can I say about, say about clear masks that at the moment there aren't any that have been approved for use? For They haven't actually um, gone through all the testing that's required. There is one that is going through that process now, but the clear masks that are available generally are not. They, they don't filter out the virus as we would expect, like the surgical masks. So they're not currently approved. So just be aware that if you're using them, they won't really be a replacement for surgical masks. Yeah, but we are waiting, as I said, for um, something to come onto the market. I think there's a, a product that's going to be tested fairly soon. So uh, any other really con big concerns that people wanted to respond to? Um, just for people at home that might not, for the elderly people or people at home that don't have access to online support, all of the information on the Your COVID Recovery site that Sarah and I were part of developing is downloadable via PDF. So neighbours, friends and family can download specific sections if there are people who require that support but don't have access. And GPs can also do that for patients too. So that can support some people who have access issues. Thank you. And I saw a question, um, Sarah and Camilla, about the pickups tool and whether that's UK wide. Um, I'm assuming because it's through the Intensive Care Society, it would be, but I don't make that assumption. Could you just yeah. confirm either way? Yeah, any region that's covered by Intensive Care Society, unless they have their own regional uh, something in Ireland. I think it was related to Ireland, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. As far as I'm aware, yes, it is. OK, so I just want to say a really big thank you to our panellists for joining us and uh, for, well, obviously for providing us with an incredible update on what you've learned so far. And obviously to Anusha, who's been amazing, I think, to help us really to have a sense of how it feels and your recovery, Anusha, and, and where you've got to now. I think we all want to wish you the best as you go forward with your recovery. Uh, but a big thank you to Camilla Dawson, to Sarah Wallace, Gemma Clooney and H Hannah Crawford, thank you so much. You've been amazing. You've worked at the pace as always to get this uh, together. So we really want to say a big thank you to you. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks for everyone for, to everyone for joining us. And don't forget to fill in your evaluation. That was my final point. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.